Um, Madam Clerk, call the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee meeting to order. And if you would please call the roll. Alderman Tyus. Present. Alderman Muhammad. Accused uh, absent. Noted. Alderman Gunther. Here. Alderman Boyd. Here. Alderman Middlebrook. Excused absence. Alderman Narayan. Present. Chairman Moore. Excused absence. Noted. For present, you have quorum. Being that we have a quorum, the meeting of the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee meeting is called to order. The first thing on the agenda is uh, approval of the minutes. For that. Yes, so okay. we can have a roll call. Then we'll let you go. <laughs> <laughs> the older woman has to go, so. No. Wait a minute. Let me read it. I'll read it. If you take a minute to look over the minutes, if you don't have any objections, I'd entertain a motion to um, pass approval minutes from the Monday, June 3rd meeting. So moved. We have, uh, we've moved and seconded uh, to approve the meetings. Clerk, would you please call the roll? Alderman Tyus. Aye. Alderman Muhammad. Alderman Gunther. Aye. Alderman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Middlebrook. Alderman Narayan. Aye. Chairman Moore. That's four I votes. All right, um, Alderman. Anytime you have too long as you don't um, mind us doing previous role. Fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have before us a board bill 22, I'm th sorry, 32 committee substitute, I think. We got a committee substitute. Is that right, Alder Alderman Boyd? That's correct, Madam okay. Chair. Um, did, you, did everyone get a committee substitute? Mine okay. is not marked committee substitutes. Okay, so we need to get the committee substitutes uh, before us. He did give us one. I think I got it in my box or something. Thank you. I have one. Okay. Mine is good marked up. Um, Alderman Boyd, if you would like to make a presentation and, yes. and if you have people that you need to speak, bring them up or which order do you want? Do you want to do a presentation and then us ask you questions or would you like to bring all the people that you have to speak up? What, what is that? Um, I would like to go ahead and do a, a presentation and then I'm not doing the entire presentation and then if you don't mind, uh, people can come up and kind of testify. We have a group of good people here technical experts, if you will. Okay, make sure that they remember to say who they are into the mic when they come up, okay? Yes. All right, um, if you would proceed with board bill number 32, committee substitute. Um, do the committee members need a member minute? Uh, the things that are changed are highlighted. I got it. Are you okay? Yep. Proceed. Okay, um, Madam Chairperson, I'd like to ask if the committee would put or Bill 32 committee substitute before you. I know it was emailed, but I didn't know uh, maybe protocol is to actually vote yes, on putting it before us. Yes, we have to do that before we, we have to put that before us, okay. you are correct. So I didn't know if you want me to talk about just 32 or we'll just do a move. motion for committee substitute, if that's what you're gonna be doing, and then we will approve that, and then we'll speak up to that one. Is well, unfortunately, I'd be out of order Why? since I'm not on the committee. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not you. I need there to be a motion. I'm out okay. of order. I said it wrong. I'm sorry. Okay. okay. Um, if someone would do a motion just for purposes of discussion to put Board Bill 32 Committee Substitute before us. Second. Previous roll. Being there's a motion for uh, and a, a second and a call for previous roll. Is there an objection for previous roll? Seeing none, Board Bill 32, Committee Substitute is before us. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chairperson, members of the committee. I would like to also pass out and offer 
a final version of Board Bill 32 Committee Substitute. And I say that because there were some Scribner errors. And so I, I, I passed them out to the clerk. Um, there were some instances where, do you have extra copies of Becky? I'll, maybe I'll just read the email. Excuse me, ma'am. I think the sponsor. Did you have extra copies to hand out just so that they have it before them? Yes. I have another copy. Okay, I want to make sure the chairperson has a copy. I think that's right. So. <clears throat> and these are the copies with the correct okay. errors. Just the final version, that's correct, what I just passed out. I need you to recognize you. I'm sorry. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, do you have something to pass out? Yes. Thank you. Do that. Thank you. Okay, this is the third one I can post. <laughs> okay, yes, so. you're going to have to do some explaining here. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Golly, can you tell me what you're passing out? Yeah, let me show it to you because I have not reviewed it. Did you just get this from the city council? Yes. Okay, so they already have it. Oh, okay. So now you have two okay. of the I same final so version. So we're going to pass back because we don't want all this paperwork because we're going to send Thank one Thank you. Of, right. That these, doesn't make these any sense. These are extra ones for Sharita later. Okay. So, okay. She okay. Have to know. so it's two of the same thing. We don't want to be any more confused. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and, and read it. It's kind of short and quick. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'll say there's a com some corrected changes. Um, there was an error existing on page two, line 17. And that would be um, the new copy you gave us? Right. The substitute. No, okay. the, the new copy is the final absolute, but I did want to share with you, you the changed? little minor Scribner errors. Okay. If you want me to go through it, fine. If not, we could just move on. No, 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 no. I would like you, because I have my marked up copy, so you, okay. I read this. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, why don't you? Okay, sorry. Tell who you are. And say who you are. I'm Rebecca Wright. I'm with the city councilor's office. Thank you. Um, the Scrivener errors were my fault. I was rushing, and I checked over my draft again this morning when I was printing my 30 copies and realized, so I apologize for that. You always read what you wrote, not what you actually wrote. You know, <laughs> in your mind, it's like, this is what I put down there. Right. I so, understand. Thank you. Because uh, I can't spell. <laughs> so uh, I just want to clarify, when I was explaining where the corrections were, I was doing it from the... the the, the draft that was online. And so I can take you through where the changes are because I know um, based on where they are in this committee sub. Okay. So I'll explain it to you actually. So can go you to give us page and then like absolutely line number two or line number. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you go to page two okay. and you go to line 18. Um, we don't have line. Oh, this one does. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the one I got doesn't have line numbers. Okay. Page two, line 18. Yes. And, and you'll see the bracketed and stricken out phrase or, or words, the city councilor. Yes. That is, um, was supposed to have been taken out because I had referenced it elsewhere and I just forgot to do it there. So that's taken out and that's one of the changes. Okay. Um, the next one is on page seven. At the bottom, you'll see a lot of um, underlined and bolded language. And on line 17, you'll see that the word uh, determines, membership determines. I had had it not plural before, so I, I added the plural. Okay. Um, or, yeah. And then the other thing that I did is I changed the word from should to shall. So it says, um, now it reads, its voting membership determines that it shall remain. Okay. And then the last one occurred on the next page, on page eight at the top. Uh, this is the redacted language from that paragraph. And I had to simplify my, my efforts when I was making the corrections, I, I just went in there and automatically just kind of made the changes and then I realized, oops, I, I made it to the language that I need to bracket to. So I then went back and I typed in the paragraph and I typed in the wrong paragraph. So this is the correct one now <laughs> that's supposed to be deleted. Okay. 
And that's it um, as far as the changes between what was provided yesterday and what you have now. Okay, so on my committee substitute that I marked all up, it says, that, so you you changed it. So you put the correct thing out that you were taking out. Okay. Correct, correct. Right, so see. It just was a typographical, I, I looked at, you know, I was looking at a different paragraph and I just, in my haste, typed up the wrong thing and I should have just gone back and done a copy and paste and done, a, you know, I, right. what I did, I it just, it. yeah, got it. <laughs> Okay, is that it? Yep, that's it. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, hey, Alderman. Thank you again, uh, Madam Chairperson, members of the committee. The Board Bill 32 is, is an exciting bill. It's a bill that established a criminal justice coordinating council. And why I'm excited about the bill is it provides an opportunity and a framework and a structure whereby each entity that deals with the criminal justice system is part of this council where they actually talk to each other. So where there's a in the past there's always been a breakdown in the communication, there's been finger pointing. They actually can come together and talk about some of the issues that they have directly with their counterparts so they can streamline a process whereby we don't continue to have people that's stuck in a criminal justice system after a week of being nolly processed or basically you know, being told their case is dismissed. Um, I've had a chance to attend one of the meetings. They have actively been meeting just voluntarily without having a actual um, codified structure in place or a bill that authorized them as an entity. And I was very impressed uh, listening to the conversation and how they're working well together and how they're realizing that, well, you do that and I do that or I didn't get the information and I wish I could be part of getting the information. And it was just as simple as saying, oh, well, I'll just add you to the email so that we can seamlessly have a process whereby information flows a lot fluidly so that we don't have, again, people stuck in the system and people really don't know, you know, that they really should be out and at home with their families. Um, in, in a nutshell, the, the major players that are part of this is the Sheriff Department, the 22nd uh, Judicial Court, the Circuit Attorney's Office, the Missouri State Public Defender's Office, and the Director of the Department of Corrections. They're like the major players, but as you read through the bill, and we'll do a full uh, presentation by uh, Debbie Allen when she comes up, and Judge um, Mueller, who's the presiding judge over the courts. Um, it, it, it reminds me of being here for 16 years and departments actually, actually don't talk to each other which is mind-boggling to me. We get so much done if we actually communicate. This department is doing, the health department is doing some of the same things that forestry may be doing as far as citing people for the exact same issue. And we need to get away from that and we need to communicate more effectively. And this process also establishes a framework where they become an actual bona fide entity where they can apply for grants. And those who have been in nonprofit sector for many years know that the trend is moving toward corporations and even government entities funding people who are collaborating together, who have strong collaboration. So that's why I'm excited about this. But I want the technical experts to kind of really walk you through how this works, how it will shape out, and what outcomes that they're looking for. And so the first person I'm going to introduce is Ms. Debbie Allen, who then will introduce the judge who is going to be leading and chairing this whole process. Debbie Allen is a FUSE fellow, a phenomenal individual, has a wealth of knowledge in this field. And the city of St. Louis is fortunate to have, I believe, is it three FUSE fellows? Did you say FUSE? FUSE, F-U-S-E. And these are people who, in order to get into the program, has to already have an in-depth knowledge of the subject matter, who actually has experience in this particular field. And Debbie has done this before somewhere else in the United States. I forget exactly where, but she can explain that to you. So this is not new to her. It would be new to the city of St. Louis. It would be new to the state of Missouri. And the city of St. Louis will be on the, the cutting edge as far as implementing a structure like this and a plan and really improving our justice system. This um, is also part of what the circuit attorney talked about as far as criminal justice reform um, and what other outside entities have been, you know, on this, the, the board of aldermen about criminal justice reform, you know, the, the organization 
um, I can't think of the name, John Chashanoff always comes to mind. He's been part of the organization and really pushing us to do things differently. And this is a wonderful opportunity for us to do things differently and make our system a better system so that we don't have as many people incarcerated, especially on Fairly, and giving them opportunities to go th to programs that uh, will give them a second chance. So with that, uh, I'm going to you know, bring Miss Debbie Allen up to kind of walk you through some of this. And then after Debbie, she will introduce uh, Judge Mueller, who is the presiding judge in the 22nd Circuit. Debbie. I'm a little shorter. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Chairwoman. Um, I like to, well, I'm Debbie Allen, and I am um, here under the fuse a fellowship, and I am housed in the mayor's office, and I serve as an executive advisor. And Might my need to speak it to your microphone a little bit more because we have to record these. There we go. That's probably better. There you go. Um, let me start that over. Um, I'm here, and I am housed in the mayor's office, serving as an executive <laughs> advisor on working on criminal justice reform. Very specifically, I was asked to come um, under at her request to come in and work with elected and appointed officials and key stakeholders in the community to help the city of St. Louis to institutionalize and operationalize a criminal justice coordinating council along with um, creating what we call a justice and public health information sharing ecosystem in a year. Okay, all right. Um, I came here in October, and I'm just so excited to be here just to give you just a taste of what this group has already been accomplishing um, just since October. Um, but before I get into the very specifics about what is a, you know, what the, the group has been working, I really want to um, have Judge Mullen uh, come and speak. Judge Mullen, at the time that I came, was the presiding judge for the 22nd Circuit, and he um, was designated to be the chair of the council. His reign ended January 1st, correct? That's right. <laughs> and, um, and then uh, uh, presiding judge uh, Burleson um, is now the presiding judge. But for continuity purposes, it's really important, particularly right now in the city of St. Louis, that we have continuity. Um, and so Judge Mullen was asked if he would continue to be the chair of the council, and he graciously said yes. So he really is my partner in crime, no pun intended, um, on this project. And so I very much want him to start the conversation and give you a framework of what this means to the city. And then I will come back up, and I'm going to give just a little bit more detail. And I got some great visuals for you. Do you need a board or something to? Uh, no, ma'am. I'll just lift it up for you, um, and um, and then behind me, I'll introduce just this is a sample of the council. I've asked them to come and um, ask them if they could speak to the value and what it has meant to them already in their agency. So, just really happy that they're here. Anyway, so Judge Mullen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Mullen. As Debbie said, I was the presiding judge of the City of St. Louis Courts from uh, two years, six, uh, 17 and 18. And then beginning in 19, I stepped down as the presiding judge, and now I'm a regular trial judge that serves in the circuit. Um, I'm very happy to be here this afternoon to talk on behalf of this bill. Let me just give you a brief background on where it came from. So back as Alderman Tyus will remember. Alder Division, woman. Alder woman, Alder woman Tyus will <laughs> remember <laughs> back in the day when we first met and she was a public defender and I was a prosecutor. Division 16 is still Division 16 and it's sort of the criminal centralized division of where all the cases come from. And I spent two years in Division 16 as the judge and 16 before I was the Division 1 presiding judge. And at that time, the, the sitting prosecutor at that time came to me and said, she had this idea for a criminal justice coordinating council that she had seen in another, some city uh, group that she went to. The other cities were coming up with this and it seemed to be working very well. Would I get on board with her? And I did. And we got together and we got about half of the entities that are on this board bill to come together. The chief of police, the sheriff, the uh, public defender, the prosecutor, the courts, things like that. We came together and we met for about eight months and we were crawling 
making progress. And then we got the, the election of 16 came and we got a new prosecutor, we got a new sheriff, we got a new chief of police, we got it, I mean, almost every player in our group changed and it fell apart after that. I, I, I rotated out of Division 16 so there was a new judge involved. And although ever, I kind of said, hey, I think that we were really making good progress on this, and everybody said, that sounds like a great idea, Judge, but here's the deal. I'm just starting in my job, and I need to get my feet wet and figure out what I'm doing before I jump into this. So the reason that I'm here to talk about why I think the bill is important for the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council is it sort of codifies the importance of what we're doing. Without the bill, my fear is the good work that we're doing, and we already are doing good work. We've, as Alderman Boyd pointed out, as Ms. Allen pointed out, we've been meeting since about November, I guess. Uh, we meet on a monthly basis. There's three committees. They meet on a monthly basis. And then some of their subcommittees meet. You understand with meetings how subcommittees go and how you meet. But we also are accomplishing great things. One of the things we're accomplishing is we're able to come together. And when you bring, when you look around the, meet, the meeting room at one of our criminal justice coordinating councils and you see the chief of police, the city councilor, the presiding judge of the circuit, the elected circuit attorney, the public defender herself, the head of the public defender's office in the city, the Dale Glass, who's in charge of the jail here, Commissioner Glass, um, Vernon Betts, the elected sheriff. All the people who have real power in their own systems come together and don't just talk about ideas, but we put out things put out fires that are growing up. We also talk about anticipating problems that we're gonna have and how we need to address that. One quick example is we, we were together yesterday for Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, sub, I call them subcommittees, but really it's just a committee under the CJCC. And our topic was the new bond reform that's starting July 1st. And it's going to affect just about every player in this because the judges have to do things differently, which means the sheriffs have to do things differently, which means the, the jail has to do things differently, the public offenders have to do things differently. And instead of just each person operating in their own individual silo of this is how I'm going to do it, we had a meeting uh, which shouldn't be earth shattering, but just the fact that we have a committee now that we can call together and say, we're gonna call this committee together. We all came together, we all talked about what role we were gonna have in implementing the new rule to make sure that arrestees have a more timely appearance in front of a judge for to have their bond reviewed to make sure that um, even after the initial appearance, there's another chance for a bond review within a week after the time they originally appeared what your job's gonna be in making that happen, what the sheriff's job is gonna be, what the circuit attorney's job is gonna be, what the public defender's job is gonna be. And, and, but for the CJC coming together, when that starts on July 1st, I dare say it would be a mess. It still may not be perfect, but I'll tell you what, everybody there was willing to listen to what everybody else had to say. We, we changed the time of when we were gonna do things based upon what the sheriff's office could do with the circuit attorney's office. There was a lot of flexibility, and I think the fact that we had met together before under the CJCC from October until June, people were familiar with each other, and there was a trust built already within that room of knowing that if I was gonna do something on behalf of the courts or if somebody was speaking on behalf of one of the other um, agencies that are under the board bill, that you could take them for what they're worth. So the CJCC is a great idea, and it, and it, it could work you know, in a lot of different forms, but I think that the board bill is really important in order to give it teeth, if you will. That might be the wrong phrase, but sort of give it, maybe to kind of be the, the co concrete that holds it together to show that yes, this is something that regardless of who the circuit attorney is, regardless of who the public defender is, regardless of who the judge is at the time, this is a committee that we want to bring together. And the last thing I'll say that we did on this board bill that we didn't do when we were kind of kicking and screaming and scratching to put it together maybe back in 2015 is we brought in the mental health department and that's so important. The communication department we brought in like Debbie talked about, we also brought in the mental health department because that was really lacking in what we were kind of, when we were sort of just taping it together as a CJCC, we knew there were things that were missing, important players in the criminal justice system that were not being recognized, that were not given enough voice. And under the board bill, we have key mental health players who are coming in and talking to everybody else who's involved in the criminal justice system about what their role is and how they can help make the criminal justice system, especially in the city of St. Louis, what we're talking about here, run more effectively and smoothly and serve our entire community better. Any questions of me on that? Okay. Thank you. Um, do you want him to I answer want, questions? I wanted everybody to kind of present. 
and then we'll ask questions. Okay, thank you. No particular order, by the way. Um, Judge McCoy. You need to. Excuse oh, me. I'm sorry. Thank um, you. I'd like to bring up uh, Judge McCoy, who is your municipal court judge. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chairwoman, all women, uh, members of uh, the committee. I'm not sure what I can add uh, to what. Judge Mullen said, I will tell you that uh, in terms of uh, my top 10 list of hot problems that I have to solve administratively at municipal court, uh, three of them are under discussion, uh, really the top three. I think there's good progress on two of them, maybe a possibility of progress on the third. Um, uh, so we found it a useful process so far. Um, we don't know where we're going to get to completion on any of our issues, uh, but uh, in addition to what Judge Mullen said, it gives us, at least in our position, a chance to understand why things happen the way they do and to understand why people are doing what they do and sometimes some of the obstacles disappear or you find a way around them when you understand why people are taking the position that they are. Uh, sometimes we've butted heads in the past because we haven't had those discussions. Uh, so uh, we're very pleased uh, with our participation, um, uh, and I think it is an enterprise that needs somebody to guide it in the future. Uh, Debbie's uh, current grant is going to run out at the end of the summer. Um, Judge Mullen referred to the process having fallen apart once before. I think it's not only a change in players, but how busy the people involved are. I think it's hard to keep a process like this going if there's not someone trying to look after it. Thank you. All right, I would, um, next I'd like to bring up Ms. Donna King. She is your district probation administrator um, from the state. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, again, I don't know what I can add to all the good things about this um, bill, but um, on the selfish front, um, we had not had this before with probation and parole, and a lot of the information that we will be sharing and the partnerships that we'll gain will help our offenders that we're working with, all these justice-involved individuals that we participate with. Um, because there's a lot of information that comes out of the jail when, with assessments and um, the programming that they've done, and it's never been communicated to probation and parole before. So I think that this is very uh, beneficial to all the, um, those individuals in, invested in criminal justice so that we make sure that we're doing the right thing for them. So, okay. thank you. Thank you. And I um, should have introduced Ms. King as, um, as I will explain here in a moment, um, we have an alternatives to incarceration committee, which Mary Fox, your public defender, um, is the chair, and Ms. King is the vice chair of that. Okay, so next, again, in no particular order, I'd like to bring up uh, Sherry Schaefer. She's with the St. Louis uh, Metropolitan Police Department, and she is our co-chair, or vice chair, of our Information Sharing Governance Committee, and the chair of that is Nathan Graves, who is your court administrator. Bring this down a little bit. <laughs> You have to move. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Sherry Schaefer. I am an IT manager at the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. And as Debbie noted, I've been vice chairing the Information Sharing Governance Committee for the CJCC. And um, what I will let you all know is I have a little bit of difficulty in containing my excitement about the CJCC. 
Um, I've been a, an employee of the city of St. Louis for 21 years. And um, the kind of collaboration that we are seeing as part of this effort is just unprecedented in my experience. Um, so I know Debbie's gonna present some of the work that we've done thus far. We've been meeting since November, I believe. Yeah. And um, we did an actual system mapping of criminal justice systems and identified potential areas of improvement. So when we talk about information systems, we really want all of our criminal justice systems to be accurate, complete, and efficient. And we want to be identifying areas for um, where people are needing information and not receiving it and getting that information flowing in the most efficient way. And so that's part of what our committee has been doing, identifying pain points. And again, I've got a great committee. A couple of people are here that are on the committee, um, including Judge Can you look at us when you're talking? Oh, you're sorry. <laughs> we're recording. <laughs> um, yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, the, the work that we're doing is so important. And um, I think that the formalization of the council will do a lot for continuing the work. Because as the players change, and again, I've been here for 21 years, the players change, but then those relationships, this gives a, an opportunity for those relationships to be forged and maintained even as new people come in. Um, additionally, for your IT systems to really be successful, um, you really want the systems to be aligned with the needs of the agencies. And so to actually come to a council meeting and see all of the key players, all of the agency heads for the city of St. Louis in criminal justice, sitting together talking about common goals, problems that are occurring, it just presents this wonderful opportunity to solve things with, with technology. We can do smarter things by identifying those types of pain points. So um, I thank you for considering the bill and I thank uh, Alderman Boyd for uh, introducing it and thank you Debbie for all the work that you've been doing. So, thank you. Thank you. We need to uh, hold on just a minute while our cameraman adjusts things. <laughs> this is so that the public can see what we're doing, okay? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, so, Madam Chair, I'd like to introduce our last um, voice that is, happens to be here. Um, as you will note that in the board bill, it talks about that there will be two voting members from the community um, representing um, key stakeholders. Uh, Judge Mullen um, identified um, the stakeholder being from public health, and um, it was decided, and we invited uh, Serena Muhammad from the St. Louis Mental Health Board to to be that person. I'm sorry, Serena Muhammad from where? Um, from the, is it St. Louis? From the St. Louis Mental Health Board. Okay. And uh, she um, graciously um, accepted the offer, so she is a voting member on the council. And she also chairs the Public Health Committee. And the vice chairs of that, we have two, um, because that, um, there's a lot of work happening in that group. Um, um, the vice chair is uh, Commissioner Dale Glass, as well as Craig Smith from the city's Department of Health. We never heard of him before. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully in a good way. Okay. And so um, I would like to ask Miss uh, Miss Muhammad to come up. Um, and thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Serena Muhammad. I'm the director of strategic initiatives for the St. Louis Mental Health Board. We are a quasi-governmental entity. You bring that up because so. I know you are a lot taller than me. <laughs> Thanks. There you go. Uh, we invest in behavioral health services for uh, city residents, so adults and youth. Um, we have a few grants that we give that are directly related to uh, criminal justice. And this is an opportunity for us to have um, a legitimized agency or organization to work through. 
One of the challenges that we have when we're allocating resources, whether it's our own tax dollars or federal funds that we also manage, is determining what the priorities are for the city. Uh, without having one unified coordinating body, it is difficult to understand where we should invest our resources, where we should have our organizations providing their services. Um, we provide more than $11 million a year in services in behavioral health, and much of that is directed by the organizations who request uh, funding. So this gives us an opportunity to actually hear from the systems directly on what their shared priorities are so that we can then direct resources that address those shared priorities. Uh, without having one coordinating body, it becomes very difficult to really understand uh, where we should concentrate our efforts. So one of the things that's been useful for my participation is to have a better understanding of what some of the challenges are within the system and where we can actually leverage the community resources that we have access to to address those challenges. Uh, without having that coordinating body, um, we end up doing things that sometimes work at cross purposes. So we're hoping that by establishing this as a legitimized um, entity with some authority, then we'll have one central point of information, one central point of contact to help us inform our strategy as we're trying to support criminal justice reform as well. So, that's it. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. How do you go after that? Okay, that's great. Um, Chairwoman, I'd like to, I actually just saw that Nathan Graves, who is the 22nd Circuit Court Administrator, just arrived. I know we've got a lot of meetings going on right now with, I'm sure you've heard in the paper what's going on here in the city, so very uh, fortunate that Nathan was able to come over here and speak. So I'd like to introduce him, and as you might have just heard, uh, Nathan is the chair of the Information Sharing uh, Governance Committee. And so I'd like to bring him up. Thank you, Debbie, and thanks for allowing me the opportunity here today. Um, I'll just be brief. I had a chance just to hear what Serena uh, mentioned, and I couldn't agree more and echo exactly what she said in terms of having a single point of contact. Uh, it's, it's incredibly uh, valuable for us to be able to come together and have a forum. Um, and I think it's best shared with just one quick example that just occurred yesterday, as a matter of fact. Um, Again, as, as maybe you've heard, we have uh, some new Supreme Court rules going into effect on July 1st, which require us to change the way that we're doing some hearings over at the court. And, uh, you know, it's, it's much bigger than just the court. It's not just how we do our business, but it's also the entire criminal justice system. So to really manage a project of that scope that cross-cuts all of these different criminal justice agencies, the ability for us to have a single place to come together and talk about these. And so uh, in, in the interest of going through and pulling everybody together to talk about our rollout plan for July 1st, rather than having to uh, leverage the assistance and the resources of many, we were able to go to one place, and that was the CJCC. We called a meeting. Everyone was there. They were eager to help. And if you can imagine a room of criminal justice agencies, some 40 or 50 people, everybody there, rowing in the same direction, on an important and difficult topic because not everybody agrees with how we should start or how we should do what we're about to start on Monday. Um, however, the spirit that was there of cooperation among the agencies was tremendous and it allowed us to have a productive conversation, a productive process over the last several months to be able to prepare. And I can gratefully say that we're ready to start on Monday. It won't be perfect but it will be a good starting point and we will be able to reconvene um, uh, regularly to be able to check in, see how we're doing, and make changes as we need. And so, again, just to sum up, um, the CJCC gives us this forum that we didn't have before. And so I, I couldn't uh, support this anymore uh, in terms of uh, just the work that's been done uh, by both Debbie and Will as well. Appreciate the mayor's efforts in bringing this um, this initiative to St. Louis in terms of FUSE, and we really hope that this continues, and I see the board bill as uh, one of the next ways to really codify this and to move it forward in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, Chairwoman, um, so I want to, thank you everybody, by the way. Um, so I want to just briefly um, talk about these, uh, 
these documents up here. Um, I want to take the conversation to what, does, what is the structure of the CJCC? And I want to talk about just sort of the, you know, the, this contemplate an individual going through your criminal justice system and, and just give an example of what it might have been like prior to October and what it, the possibilities of it today. And to show you just the tremendous work that's been done. You know, um, we did a, 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 we collaborate a lot with uh, the Missouri State Highway Patrol. And uh, because they are, to us, the criminal justice agencies, they are our body that gives us structure on how we share and disseminate criminal justice information. They are the regulatory body here in the state, designated by the governor. So we have a wonderful partnership with them that, be honest with you, prior to October didn't exist. And so we have been actually forming that relationship with them. Um, and so, um, so I was gonna say, so I just wanna take you to that moment and where we started in October with our partnership with Highway Patrol. It'll get to these diagrams. And, uh, but first let me hand you this. Um, so what I did is I put together a diagram of just a visual of what the structure of the CJCC is, who chairs their vision, mission, and goal statement. And as what you heard, I think from basically everybody, is that this group, prior to coming to October, they were not all on the same page. They didn't have a shared vision, mission, and goal statement. They really did just see their role as their agency. We call this journey silo to ecosystem. And that's the way that we will create a fair and equitable criminal justice system here in the city of St. Louis. So what happened um, when I first came here, I started working with the, the, the elected and appointed officials and, and started asking them, what does a fair and equitable system look like to you? And where do you all want to start working? Because we have to prioritize. And so through their leadership and through their commitment, they all agreed that they would like to work on these three areas, and then they formed these committees. Public health, information sharing governance, and alternatives to incarceration. The first CJCC meeting was held in January of this year, and um, they've been meeting monthly. The committees also meet monthly. And they have, I've worked with each of those groups to get them, all those stakeholders that come to those committees, to get them to develop for each committee a vision, mission, and goal statement. And then the CJCC being, you know, the larger umbrella, they themselves create a vision, mission, and goals. And this way, everybody's aligned. One thing that, in every single mission statement, there's something that I also asked them to create was, what do you value? And every single one of them, it's we value the spirit of teamwork, and we value each other, and we value our roles and responsibilities. And I think that's really important to have that stated because that's where trust comes. There was not trust when I came here in October. It's, it's not complete trust either, but boy, have we come a long ways in that trust. Um, because just like what Nathan and Judge Mullen talked about, that meeting that happened yesterday, that wouldn't have happened had we not have already been meeting and trusting and communicating. And so when in, in uh, came, came here in October, and I, I certainly had partnerships with Highway Patrol before I came here, and in November I said, let's have a meeting. And the first thing we need to do is we need to do a justice assessment. So we held our first meeting in the mayor's office. And you all have been to that conference room. It was full. And we had every criminal justice agency represented. And when you looked around the room, there were people there that didn't know that Ms. King was their probation and parole administrator. And they didn't know that Nathan Graves was their court administrator. 
they themselves did not know who was who within their own system. So we came together and we said we need to draw out your criminal justice system as it is today in order to understand how, where the gaps are and how you go forward. So I'm gonna walk away from this mic for a moment because that's what this map is. This is a, a snapshot of your criminal justice system, and, and I'll let you have it if you want, um, that's diagrammed to show the interplay between someone who starts at, out in, you know, at arrest, and this map just goes to the jail and courts. But this is, if somebody was arrested to, back then, this is what they had to go through to get to even the courts. And as you can even imagine, it's taken a long time for someone to get processed. And so what we've been working on between uh, now and well, then and now is how do we speed up that process? It should not take someone four to six hours to go through the booking process. And it shouldn't take four to six hours before um, someone at the jail to finally know, oh, that's who that is. We need to know that now. And when we're talking about um, bail, um, bail determination, the judge needs to know and needs to see a complete criminal justice information and history. Because if you don't, the judge could be over sentencing, under sentencing, putting them in the wrong bucket. Um, and, and also, if you if you over sentence someone and if you keep them in the jail too long, then we worry about that criminogenic thinking. We want them out in the community where they belong as their, um, as their case goes through the system. And we want the right people in the criminal justice system and we want the right people who really are better served out in the community, out in the community. So anyway, so, um, this is that map that this group put together in 30 days, which is unprecedented. The superintendent of the highway patrol said, Debbie, this is monumental, because no one does this. They came together. The other map that we did also in 30 days, which actually I can only show you a snippet of it, but all put together, it's what Ms. Schaefer referenced is the, um, we, we also did an assessment of all your different systems and how does data move and how doesn't it move. All printed out is 34 foot long. So, and you will see so many islands that were not even passing information in a smart way. We literally have people dual entering or hand, we call it the, as Judge McCoy calls it, we call it the box method of how dockets get from one entity to another when we could really be bringing it all together. So I want to show you that over here. Um, one moment. Okay, for that, because um, Jerry, yes. it, okay. it actually cannot be shown. Oh. Yep. So this is, um, I just want to show you this. Um, this has got some, we can't. Uh, show this um, to the public because it is um, under siege of security. Is it, is it picking it up? Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. But can you imagine, that's just one snippet. And I think that uh, represents the police department actually. Um, and also, yeah, the police department and maybe the jail is on there. But that's just one of I think 13 pages of your data systems. And they put that together in 30 days with the assistance of Highway Patrol. And it costs nothing, by the way, to do that. And that's just huge, that's monumental. Not even the state had done that. And um, so I'm very proud of the group for doing it. It really shows um, that St. Louis can be a leader, and you are a leader through this structure. So I wanted to show you that. And the last thing that this group is working on font is too small, I certainly can um, provide to you the website that I drew that off. So, uh, Please do that. What yes, ma'am. Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is that one of the things that they're working on is, remember, um, as you obviously were, were, um, were data rich, like any community, you're data rich, but you're information poor. 
and you don't know how to bring that data together, let alone the technology and the governance that, that needs to be wrapped around bringing data sets together. So if you remember, my other part of my project is to, um, and which is also contemplated here in the board bill, is to create the technical and the policy governance around the, um, so that these entities can share information. We can share criminal justice, and we can share public health, but we have to do it in the right and legal way. And so um, what this group is also working on is bringing those, those data sets together. What I did in the Denver metro area, which is where I most recently worked, also helping them put together CJCC and the information ecosystem, is that we built um, a dashboard and an analytics tool that brought together your, um, your jail data and public health data that was being um, captured within the jail but also out in the community and brought that together in an aggregate way and then created the analytics tool so that we can start looking at our measures of, for example, if we know that um, law enforcement is encountering an individual right there at arrest um, and we want to know the nature of it, we really don't have a good sense of that today here in the city of St. Louis, but if we create um, an analytics tool around that, gathering the proper data, we can learn, and I took a screenshot of that, this is what we developed in Denver, is we could, and this is real in lifetime, what you have is actually a, a representation of data, it's not real data, but um, we did it in a way that we were getting data near to real time, and any moment in time, I could pull up what was how much officer time, why they were encountering, what was the number one reason, why someone was incarcerated, anxiety, by the way, was the number one reason there in the Denver metro area. Um, were, they, were they coming to jail because of a misdemeanor, felony, or an ordinance? Where did that fit along the terms of race and geography, gender? Um, that was right at my fingertip, and that's what we want here too. And we're also going to be building a dashboard around that because you, that's what you want to, right? You want to see a quick snapshot of your jail population, but also the population that perhaps law enforcement is interacting with so that you, as you as policy decision makers, can be better informed yourself. So that's what this group is working to develop. Um, that funding is actually coming from the Department of Justice grant that's about nearly a million dollars. And part of that um, funding is not only to build that, you know, that technical infrastructure, but it also allows us to procure legal services from an entity that has an expertise to helping government come together to write an intergovernmental sharing agreement. Um, and also, um, we procured and closed that, and we've actually selected the Urban Institute. The Urban Institute will be working with the Public Health Committee to help them do an assessment of your criminal justice um, agency and uh, public health as to um, of the resource, you know, where are those resources and treatments and assessments happening in this right over here, this system, at every touch point. We, we say within the criminal justice system there are six intercepts, zero being community, and then the five intercepts within the justice system itself. If someone is interacting, for example, in the intercept with probation, do we have the proper treatments and assessments and resources needed as a condition of probation? Do we have the proper resources so that Ms. King's officers can be actually referring them? It isn't just about making a referral. It's about do those referrals and those service providers, can they meet the needs of the high-risk, criminogenic needs of our justice-involved popula population? So. Um, so anyway, I know there's so much to talk about, um, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of just, um, I think, as Nathan said, is why this um, board bill is so important is because it gives it, um, it codifies not only their work, but it allows ownership, which is so important when you're talking about bringing together data. Someone's got to own that, someone's got to drive that, and it needs to be in a multidisciplinary way. So. Um, I will stop, Madam Chairwoman, and um, let you ask us any questions that you may have, and I will turn it over to Alderman Boyd. Thank you. Thank you, um, 
Madam Chairwoman and Committee, that's the presentation, and we would like to uh, open up for questions if that's your will. Are these other handouts something? That, I'm not handouts, but sorry. Uh, the other big sheets, are they for us to see also, or what is it? Yes, are ma they? Yes, ma'am, you can have them. And you can look at them, too. These are really about this, ma'am. Okay, and what, what exactly is this? Well, Pre a Chairwoman, this is your criminal justice system. Here in the city of St. Louis, as we knew it in October. So it's a flow chart. Yes, that's exactly right. And this is prior to you working on it? This was, we, we built this um, in January when we presented it. Things have already changed on it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. And you'll leave this for us to. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank yes, ma'am. And is that the same thing? Is that a different one? It's the same thing. Yes, okay. ma'am. Okay. Um, it's a lot of information. Um, I want a lot of good work. <laughs> it is, uh, but it's. Uh, I have lots of questions about the, how this bill is uh, being portrayed and how it's set up. And then you just brought me a whole different set of uh, information. Alderman, I'm going to tell you, I don't think that we're going to try to vote this out. I wanted everybody to have a chance to hear everything, but I want questions. Do we have so? Um, I, I don't see anybody from the public defender's office here. No one is here from there. I don't think so. Do, wait, 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 no, wait, 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 I got more. So I also would like to see someone from the circuit attorney's office and from the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. Anybody that's a stakeholder, we are very well represented by the courts and the mayor's appointees and the judge's appointees, but I want to hear from other people. All, and, and anybody who knows me, since Judge Mullins told you I work, I'm a public defender, if you don't bring the public defenders here, you're not doing your good homework, okay? So, no, 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 that's all right. I'm just telling him. So uh, I want to hear what they have to say. And if uh, you, and the other question I have, I guess, is I like all this working together. I just don't understand why we couldn't have been doing this all the time. That's just my statement there. Government. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's local, state, or federal, it's just bureaucratic stuff. Okay, but somehow we were, from what I'm hearing, we, were, we have been meeting. Anyway, somebody put them, right. But that's an anomaly. That is something that's almost unheard of. Right, but we have been meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So saying that, because um, I want, I'm not the chair. I'm the vice chair, as you know. Um, there are some things that I also, I'm the chair of rules that I have that some problems with this bill. So I'm glad that the uh, person who uh, wrote the bill is here, because I have some things that we would not pass out of rules. So we can get this straight, because we are getting to be very stringent about how things are presented to us now. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask if uh, my members have questions, because I have my whole thing is marked up here, so I'll be last. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and going through the first person is Alderman Gunther. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with all those tabs on there, I have a feeling you probably have every question covered. Um, but uh, I will, if uh, Ms. Allen can um, come up as well. I'll, um, so it was mentioned that the um, that a lot of our rules are based off of the state highway patrol and they're kind of the ones that um, that kind of tell us how to proceed with our uh, our courts and our criminal justice system so um, my question there is um, how is our relationship with the, the state troopers the state police with some of the people that are involved in this process because I had uh, asked uh, one of our state representatives to um, uh, ask for the state highway patrol to again assist with some of the policing on our highway system and was told that the police the state troopers will no longer uh, police our highway systems because of our circuit attorney throwing out lots and lots of tickets that were issued for things that uh, to me like drugs and guns and speeding and violations that should have been prosecuted so um, how how is that relationship uh, working out and how, yeah, kind of shed a little light on that. Sure, absolutely, uh, Councilman. Um, I, I think, that, to me, I see that as two questions. So, um, probably, probably the relationship. More than that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we work with uh, the Missouri State Highway Patrol, the CJIS Division, which stands for the Criminal Justice Information Sharing Division, and that's actually rules written by the FBI. Right. And so the Missouri State Highway Patrol CJIS Division is a, a key partner to anything that we do as it relates to the sharing of information, criminal right. justice. 
So that entity is who we work very closely with. Um, they don't oversee how our court is functions or how our, it's really about the dissemination, the lawful dissemination of criminal history. They are the repository and it, that's how that stuff goes up. Our relationship then is strong. And in fact, on our Department of Justice project, they are a named member. You know, they, they want to be a part, they are a partner. Uh, they're very, very clear that they, um, they don't serve in an, an, an advocacy role. They are here to serve as, um, as a partner and helping us to understand how we stay in our lane properly. Okay. So as it relates to the relationship that you just talked about, I'm not going to go into that very specifically, because, um, but I would say that the way that you benefit through the council is improved relationships and understanding. When you have those partners coming together and they better understand what each of them does and how they actually do impact each other, then in turn what happens is those relationships that you talk about improve. Because, you know, so that was certainly before my time. I knew that that was happening. I think that it, it grew out of a misunderstanding, and then that grew out of a mistrust. Uh -huh. and, um, and so I think as long as the council allows for that trust to be rebuilt or even established. Mm -hmm. So is that relationship going to get better right now? No. But over time it will because we're working in this other area where we have that shared vision. Okay. All right, um, so that was one of the things. Um, so right now, you're essentially asking, are you're, you're acting as kind of a executive director in a way because of the FUSE grant. Correct. That uh, Department of uh, the DOG grant money is going to expire here soon. So in this bill, it talks about um, hiring a new executive director and providing a staff and all that. But is there, uh, is that going to be continue to be paid through a grant or is there going to be money that's coming in from all these different departments and the sheriff and the circuit attorney and the judges and the courts and the city to pay for this? Or there's no like fiscal note in this as to what I think there is, and I do want to clarify that m me being here is actually not paid through the Department of Justice. It's actually paid for by nonprofit organizations, okay. one of which is the Mental Health Board. Okay. The Missouri Health uh, Foundation for Health is another. Lutheran Services pays for my project. Um, and you're right, um, my contract with the city ends at the end of September. There is conversation to see if they can find funding to have me stay for another year. Okay. with the idea and hope that this board bill will allow for the creation of a position so that we have that continuity, yeah. you know, that transi transaction. Because I've worked in government for 25 years, I understand. It takes time for a fiscal note and a study. Yeah. And the I would anticipate that if a position is created, it won't happen until July of next year. Yeah. And which would be a great transition, right? Because mm -hmm. if my grant ends, my term ends in uh, September, that would be a great continuity, you know, sharing of knowledge and passion. And so, um, so with that said, how those funds come together to pay for the, the position going forward, I am not best to speak about that. I'm not sure what the discussions are around that. I don't want to speak on behalf of the city because I'm not the city and I'm certainly not the mayor's office either. Okay. So yeah, I'm sure that as we continue discussion, Alderman Boyd will probably have uh, more answers to that. As It was my understanding that the mayor's office would find the funding for it, whether it's out of general uh -huh. revenue or maybe it's through additional grant. But if we codify this, it, it, the mayor almost doesn't have a choice. Right. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to function. Right. And then this, all this gymnastics of trying to put this together would be all mute. Yeah. So. Yeah, I was just I wasn't sure if there was, I, you know, the possibility of a ongoing grant to help fund it, or if the word would come out of general revenue, like you. We would definitely have to find the funds for it if we want to keep it alive, okay. and if we're really serious about criminal justice reform, it's something that's almost like a mandate that we would have to do. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, and um, Councilman. Um, 
to speak to him is that when we think about, there are CJCCs across the country, and um, I've done a lot of work around um, helping to establish those. And what I can tell you, we did a study on what are the key ingredients to a successful CJCC and, and what isn't. Um, and a key indicator is full-time um, full staff, mm -hmm. skilled staff, dedicated to this project. It's like what Judge Mullen said, that group fell apart. Well, another reason why is because they didn't have a full-time staff person yeah. really shepherding it. So um, I, I think the point is made that if you don't invest in that full-time position, it will inevitably fall apart, and that would be unfortunate. Yep. Um. So we have the St. Louis Mental Health Board as a part right now as kind of for our, let's see here, um, uh, under this public health committee. Mm -hmm. um, what other agencies in the city are we working with? Because um, I have, like this week I met with um, Places for People um, and uh, they're getting ready to move into the ninth board. So would organizations such as Places for People be brought into? They actually sit on the Public Health Committee. Oh, and I just man, want to mention great. real quick, it, it, Serena, because you know these names better than me, um, is that um, Serena doesn't just represent the Mental Health Board. She represents, she's the point person for the Public Health stakeholders as a whole. Okay. And she's really instrumental in making sure that we invite the right people to serve on these committees. So do you want to give them a taste to who sits on your committee? Sure. So we do have Places for People, okay. um, Behavioral Health Response, which is the crisis intervention um, phone number for the whole uh, region, mm -hmm. uh, Behavioral Health Network, which is all of the federally qualified health centers, community mental health centers, and hospitals, um, East West Gateway, because of their role with planning, um, the University of Missouri St. Louis Criminology Department, um, the Integrated Health Network, they have a, a program called Relink where they look specifically at helping people who are exiting the jail connect to behavioral health services as well as primary care services. Um, and all of those are coalitions that represent multiple organizations. So on, in the nonprofit sector, we really do try to focus on collaborative bodies. Mm -hmm. So this committee convenes those collaborative bodies. Gotcha. Okay. Wonderful. And on the um, Alternatives to Incarceration Committee, which is chaired by Ms. Fox, um, I can tell you that the um, obviously for each committee, every criminal justice agency is represented, but particularly on that group, we have the Arch Defenders is uh, represented. Mm -hmm. um, we have the director for the Transition Center is represented. And well, Ms. Donna, would you, who else sits on your committee? from the nonprofits. Excuse me for a minute. Um, could you give us a list of the different committees and who, would that be better for you print it out or email, t if you can email it? Uh, it's, it's right there. It's very small. Yeah, yes, <laughs> ma'am. And you were gonna, you said something about your website. Is it on your website? It's actually, we do, it's on the city website. Oh, it's on the city It's website, website. yes ma'am. Okay. In fact, if you just Google uh, City of St. Louis, CJCC, it comes up. Okay. And we've actually put everybody's mission, vision, goal statement. What we're working on right now is actually listing all of the committee members. So if you can just give me a day or two, right. um, it will be up there. And um, yes, ma'am. That's better than trying to take yeah. notes. That's a really now. good point. Thank Plus, you. I don't know all these names, so <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm sorry. No but, problem. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was exactly what I was asking. But asking I hear for. what your point is. You want yeah. to make sure, do we have that broad-based, that ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Um, I'm, I would, uh, I guess, just say that I think this is a, a wonderful idea. Um, I think uh, not only the criminal justice system, but I think that in government here we look at a lot of different ways that we're siloed, uh, even in just like one ward and having neighborhood associations that are siloed off and, uh, and that just kind of filters its way all the way up to the criminal justice system. So um, I'm eager to look at this flow chart and see how things were in the past and uh, if, you know, hopefully we can get rid of a couple of those squiggly lines and a couple of those boxes and make it more of a, a straight arrow from point A to point B, then uh, not only will that help us with the issue that we have with people sitting in the workhouse house and, and, and uh, you know, our jail systems for um, months and months at a time just waiting on a, a, tr a trial or a hearing um, or waiting on, you know, trying to make 
bail or something like that. So hopefully this will be able to take care of a couple different things that we have uh, issues, including reducing, um, you know, the, the prison population that we're holding right now. So, um, so for that, I know there's lots of questions coming. So uh, I would just say good job. Thank you for putting this together. And uh, I think it's a great plan. Input. Thank you. So. Okay. Alderman Narayan. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Uh, and uh, thank you. Th this is uh, exciting stuff. I, I, I uh, am looking forward to, uh, to working with Alderman Boyd and, and with, with you all on uh, criminal justice reform. I think it's something that is uh, overdue and sorely needed in the city. So I'm uh, excited about that and excited about what you've uh, presented so far. Um, uh, Judge Mullen, if you if you don't mind, I did have a, just a couple questions for you. He left. He's in that. Oh. So. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse you look me. just like him. What do you mean? Oh, pardon me. <laughs> he only wish he looks as good as you do. Um, Judge Mullen, before he left. Um, oh, did you want to have questions? Uh, yeah, yes, oh, yes, yes. There you go. I'll take a try for those things. <laughs> we need to speak in the... Okay. Very, so uh, I, I would just be remiss if I didn't ask. I, I've spent some time over in your municipal court. You said that this addressed uh, uh, three priorities that you wanted to touch on. Uh, uh, pr problems that we had, one of them involves the highway patrol. Uh, and actually, to your question, Alderman Gunther, we've uh, had a practice with the uh, circuit attorney where the traffic cases that are refused by the circuit attorney's office have come to municipal court. So everything that gets referred to us, uh, we prosecute. One of the problems uh, that we've been able to address in this process is trying to automate the process of the cases coming over from the circuit attorney's office uh, to the city councilor. Uh, so what we used to have was what we called the box method, where uh, they threw the tickets in a box and one of our people came over and picked it up and we did manual case origination. Sharita was there when we started doing that. <laughs> um, uh, and so that's one process that actually with the involvement of uh, the highway patrol uh, and with Regis, we hope we're going to be able to automate so there's not going to be duplicative uh, uh, processes. Um, another uh, one of the issues uh, has to do with the process of getting data that is supposed to be reported to the highway patrol uh, for a national uh, database, uh, which we call the offense cycle number. Uh, because our uh, dispositions are supposed to be reported to the state highway patrol uh, so that when a police officer, for instance, is investigating a case, they can get a full criminal history of that individual. Uh, that reporting has not been getting done because we've lacked the tactical, uh, technical means um, with the police department to get all that information, which is biometric information. Um, so part of where we are now um, is that uh, grants are going to be applied for through the highway patrol, through the organization sort of getting past everybody not talking to each other. Uh, we're going to get uh, some live scan machines, which is what's used in prisoner processing now. But we'll have an additional uh, 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 live scan machine in the Justice Center. We'll have one live scan machine in city courts. We're going to improve the uh, process of getting that information distributed properly uh, because this data, uh, the idea of an off offense cycle number is so there's one record that follows the entire history of one particular offense up to disposition. Um, the police department has been getting this information and sending it to the highway patrol, but there's been an issue with the highway patrol successfully getting the offense cycle number back to the agencies here so that we know whether or not that information has been obtained. Uh, so we think we're going to solve that problem, and it's a statutory mandate for us to do that, uh, and one that we were having a hard problem with. Uh, the third issue, which is further in the future, but one we're working on now because it's a big one, um, is that uh, the Supreme Court and the State Court Automation Committee wants us to move uh, to use a statewide um, case management system that they call show me courts in all municipal courts. Um, it's a product that 
is under development, maybe not quite ready, but it's going to be likely coming for us in the future. It's going to produce some budget issues. Um, and so this process has at least uh, the Justice uh, Coordinating Council has afforded us some opportunities to have direct meetings with people up the food chain in this process. Uh, hopefully to have a discussion to where when we have to make a migration it's not going to be such a hardship for us uh, because if we were to have to migrate to that system right now the way it is uh, it would double our staff needs it would limit our capacity to process the volume that we do and um, uh, it would create budget problems we'd like to see if we can try to have a collaboration to address and alleviate those problems before we're forced to migrate. And so it's, it's two or three years away, but it's something that we have to start with now so that we don't get caught unawares uh, and do our best to try to address that problem. Whether or not we're going to be successful in doing that is a whole different issue, but we have that discussion started, uh, which is more than what we had before. <sighs> Okay, we need somebody up at the, uh, <laughs> the mic. We have a separate. What else do you want me to do? No, I was just saying, never mind. Okay, all right. Well, you sure? uh, do you still have questions for Judge? Yes. Okay, uh, Judge, I need you at the mic. Okay, we need no, you to stay uh, at the mic. Uh, that's. That, that, that's, that's all I have for Judge McCoy. Uh, thank you. Uh, my trial advocacy professor would be upset with me for asking the judge questions, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I thank you. <laughs> but, but that's all right. I'm, I'm here to answer questions, uh, and maybe I go too far into the weeds, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, we are actually uh, doing our best to try to make a better place, and so we welcome any of you to come visit our shop anytime you want to. Walk in, look at what we're doing. Uh, we're happy to give you a tour if you want one. So, Thank you, Judge. Thank you. And Judge McCoy is, 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 is certainly a one of a kind in my mind. He's very passionate about his He's service. He's been around a long time. Yes, he time. has. <laughs> uh, Alderman Boyd, uh, just uh, reviewing this, uh, it, does, it does seem to be a bit um, uh, prosecution heavy, particularly depending on the two uh, positions that the circuit, uh, that, that the presiding judge, excuse me, would appoint, uh, is, is that something that was discussed at all? Um, the, 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 the kind of balance in between maybe um, uh, 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 prosecutors and uh, law enforcement and then public defenders and other uh, uh, stakeholders uh, other criminal justice reform stakeholders. Right, I, I'll let uh, Becky answer that, thank you. Thank you. So I just wanna make sure that you're, we're all talking about the same location in the board bill. Um, are you looking at page three where there's some appointed members by the presiding judge of the 22nd Judicial Circuit shall appoint one judge? Um, so there's one judge it's, you know, that's appointed by the presiding judge. And then there are some additional members below that. You'll see that the appointed judge of the 22nd Judicial shall, at the recommendation of the executive director, appoint two voting members who represent stakeholders. Is that the area that you're talking yes, about? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, this language here particularly, um, so there's one judge that will serve on it, not the presiding judge. The pre and then this other language here talks about the two members who are representative stakeholders. Um, there are... We, I guess this was written in a way to create some flexibility as to what the needs may be at the time. Um, so there could be a situation that's more hot at the time, like health issues that are going on in the jail, and you want to have somebody from representative from the community or maybe the health department um, be involved and be a voting member at that time. Um, the other thing that this would do is it would allow, let's say, a victim advocacy person. Uh, so it was written to create flexibility based on what we would call stakeholders. Um, I don't think it was necessarily intended to be prosecutorial oriented necessarily, more of just community oriented as to issues that could be happening. Sure. No, I, I guess my, my concern is when I look at um, the voting members here. Uh, oh, with the circuit attorney's office? It, I, I see. The uh, language? The circuit okay. court judge, the municipal court judge, circuit court administration, municipal court administration, the circuit attorney district defender, the sheriff, the police commissioner, the corrections commissioner, and then we, we get into 
then the you know the non-voting members. Uh, so I have not um, been involved in maybe some of the policy decisions that happen behind the scenes. Uh, but I think Debbie could speak to that because she has been involved talking to all the representative stakeholders as to, you know, their role in, in specifically what they were interested in, whether they were satisfied with the board bill. So I can let Debbie talk to that. Thank you. Um, sure. I think um, it's good to take a step back to think about where these um, voting members fall. So when we think about the circuit court judge, that's just one, the municipal court judge is actually uh, appointed by the mayor. The circuit court administrator is, falls under the court. The municipal court administrator is also a function, uh, falls under the mayor's office. The circuit attorney will actually get, according to the board bill, gets two votes. It, that just hasn't been no. done yet. That's why that's no. in this blue, the, in the blue box. Oh no, Miss, uh, the the circuit attorney's office gets two votes. That's in your in the board bill. Um, the district. No. Oh, yes. Page. Page three, line yep. 19 through 21. She gets, one point at the end. She gets an additional. She gets an yep. yep, she gets a, an additional vote. The circuit attorney, I would like to restrain from putting people's names on stuff because this right. is about positions versus people. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. We didn't ask for that. Um, we just, yeah. okay. Um, the district uh, defender um, is a state function. Uh, the sheriff under your substitute gets two votes. Um, one must be the sheriff. And then uh, the police commissioner, that is, falls under the mayor. Corrections commissioner, again, that falls under the mayor. Probation and parole, that is a state function. And then um, currently right now, as I mentioned, we've identified as one of those stakeholders representing the public health Rep, uh, stakeholders themselves, we have not identified who that other was going to be. Just, just for the sake of conversation, um, the, someone, say, from the police officers' union could be appointed there, though, correct? I mean, I'm not saying that, that they necessarily would, but you could have it, this, it, with those two kind of floating positions, it could become very heavily skewed towards. Uh, I, law enforcement no, prosecution. I the, uh, no, it must be supportive services. Okay, okay. So that's actually in, yeah. Perfect. For that reason, right Perfect. there. It's, Thank it, you. It, it's intended to represent the community. Perfect. Mm -hmm. um, so then uh, I also noticed that uh, the, um, the, there's the uh, authority to buy and sell land. Um, I'm going to let Ms. Wright speak to that because that's a legal thing. Okay, so so just so it's clear, when we were putting this under the, um, the statutes that we use to do this, it has certain powers when you do this. So I just restated the powers. I did take some of them out. But it, let's say they wanted to have their own you know, office or something like that. I mean, I don't think that that's going to happen. I don't see why we would do something like that. But I didn't want to, I mean, we could, take that power out, but yes. I mean, that that's a power that was specifically it, laid out in the statute. So that's why I just re, re It, it does concern, concern me uh, that, that this, this, uh, this board, which, which I, uh, I, I am inclined to be supportive of, would have the authority to buy and sell land and enter into contract, which is something that... Well, so the contract is important because if they're going to be a grant recipient, and, and you want to receive a grant, let's say they're going to be a partner to a grant that maybe one of the CJCC members wants to enter into, and maybe it has to do with, in fact, doing these dashboards or something like that. You would want them to be able to have the, the power to execute a contract. Uh, would you like to speak further to that? I think uh, Alderman Boyd said it in his opening, yeah. is that the way in which federal funding and even foundation dollars are is Excuse that... Me. Can you step away from when she's speaking? Thank you. Um, and um, is that a criteria is that it be either under the structure of a CJCC or a multidisciplinary. So it is very important for the city of St. Louis to be competitive. You will want the CJCC and you will want them to be able to receive and execute grant funds and to be competitive. Th that is something that you don't believe would be able to be fulfilled by the CJCC coming up with recommendations and bringing them either to the Board of Aldermen or the Mayor's office or 
Uh, uh, no, because you got to have that function of being able to execute and be responsible for the administration of those funds. Yeah, it's a requirement of grants. You need to have ownership and it needs to be an identified, usually in an application, you have to have a lead applicant. So like for example here, like the Department of Health or you got to have that entity and so you wouldn't want to, because if you don't give them that power, then that doesn't, that makes you uncompetitive in these grants. Okay. And I also would like to uh, add to that is, you know, it, this is kind of a, a unique system that's kind of a quasi-government entity, almost like SLDC. But understand that the mayor's office will be responsible for funding the two positions. However, if for some reason they went out and decided they want to lease an office space somewhere, they'd have to basically raise the money for that for the most part. So if they have the ability to raise money, if you will, then they should also have the ability to lease or buy real estate at the end of the day because they would be generating the revenue to do it. And it, not it does not necessarily have to be public funded. I gotcha. It's just, again, like, like um, they said, it's just there in case it's needed, but it doesn't mean it'll be acted upon. Okay. It's kind of like better to have and not need than to need and not have. Sure. Understood. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you. Do you have any more? Because I have lots. <laughs> uh, there's anything when you're done that gets missed. All right. Um, so I want to go over first just the, because I, we have not spoken. When I read this, I looked at who the membership and the voting, and I was um, a bit taken back. At a point in my life, I would have been a prosecutor, but I went to the public defender's office. And once I went there, I'm, I was like a converted uh, smoker because then I found out how many people um, are falsely accused uh, and all other things. My first three cases I ever had were not guilty in under an hour. Um, and then I was hooked. So when I see this, um, the nine member ex officios, the circuit attorney is elected. The 22nd Judicial Circuit Court Administrator, Nathan, is appointed by the judges who are appointed by the governor. Is that correct? Okay. The police commissioner is appointed by the public safety director who is appointed by the mayor. Ms. Tyus. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have to wait to get the cameras adjusted. Mm -hmm. Having technical difficulties like the debate last night, huh? Yeah, you said debate <laughs> last night. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think this is the most liberal committee we're on now. But us three of us. <laughs> They're like me. <laughs> you have to pay him union wages. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, all so right. <laughs> thank you, Alderman. I didn't know. You know, I'll, 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 I'll sue for your wages, okay? <laughs> Boat control is not working. <laughs> um, so just to go over what I was saying, just in case the um, cameras didn't capture it, the circuit attorney is elected, and that actually has to be whoever the circuit attorney is there. Mm -hmm. The 22nd Judicial Circuit Court Administrator is appointed by the judges who are appointed by the governor. Mm -hmm. The police commissioner is uh, uh, hired by the public safety director who is appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. The administrative judge of the municipal division of the 22nd uh, is appointed by the governor. Well, I'm sorry, the, the mayor, right? Municipal oh, I'm judge. sorry, the municipal, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, the mayor. <laughs> I know the difference, okay? <laughs> um, the city council is appointed, is he still on there? Out. Okay, so I, this, because I had my, I read before. Your final okay. version should have yeah, it. Right. Out. It is. She told us that, but I'm still reading from my notes. The clerk of the municipal division of the 22nd um, is uh, appointed by whom? The judges? The mayor. The, the mayor. clerk of the 22nd oh, judicial. Oh, the municipal. I keep not. Okay. And who is that? Richard Torrent. Richard. Ju judge. Yeah. 
they come up here. That's, a, that's our court administrator, Richard oh. Torak. T O R A K? C K. Former provisional judge of the court. I thought that sounded familiar. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think we will need you. You can kind of sit back down again. Thank you. The Sheriff Vernon Betts is elected. So that's, so since we took Julia now, that's six now. Um, the correction commissioner uh, uh, is who is the mayor appoints that person also? Be Dale Glass. Okay. And then the probation and parole administrator for the state of Missouri is appointed by the governor or hired, or is that a, I don't know what position that is in the uh, hierarchy state. Probation and parole? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, Ms. Donna King's position. Correct. That is a state function. And is she appointed or is she uh, an employee, civil service? Okay. So I'm only having eight. So who, did we go down to eight since we got rid of Julian or did we add a, sec, a ninth one? The public defender. Yeah. Okay. So the public defender is a. Is Mary Fox. Okay. And there are two stakeholders. Okay, but I was just going to the people that were the nine members ex officio. The ex officio. Okay. okay. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Now, so then I wanted to make sure I got it right. Okay, so the. Number two, we have the appointed voting members. The presiding judge of 22nd, right? That's a voting member. No. The presiding judge merely appoints one. Appoint one of the judges. Yes, okay. yeah. Yes. One of the judges of the 22nd. Correct. So the presiding judge is appointed by the governor who then appoints somebody to represent the judges on the non, uh, the uh, appointed voting members, right? Is that correct? Okay. Um, but going back here, don't think it's a repeat. There's anything in here. That appointment is uh, at the pleasure of the presiding judge. Right, exactly. Okay, and then um, I know further down, that judge gets to appoint two other people. Okay, right. Um, Which are stakeholders in support of services. Right, but that the judge who is appointed by the, the presiding judge who is appointed by the governor appoints another judge who then appoints the stakeholders. Is that correct? I, I, I will I will say it. I think I heard it one way, but I'm I just want to state how it actually functions because I well I want no no I yeah. want to say I'm gonna run this and repeat it go, again. Repeat go, it I again. know you're a lawyer, but I'm gonna run this one from okay. this end. Okay, yeah, repeat it again. I, I just didn't that. want to okay. make sure so I heard you right. The presiding judge is appointed by the governor. Correct. And then the presiding judge appoints a judge. Yes. Uh, and then the judge appoints two stakeholders. The judge, at the recommendation of the CJCC, appoints two stakeholders. The executive director of the right. CJC. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's your question. You, you can come back. Okay. Okay. That, I have enough of my own. <laughs> So I encourage young people to, uh, young people to do it, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and the circuit attorney shall appoint one attorney from the circuit attorney's office. Correct. Okay. And the sheriff shall appoint one deputy sheriff. Correct. Okay. Then we go to non-voting members. Circuit attorney gets one non-voting member. Yes. The police commissioner gets one non-voting member. Correct. Okay. And then the mayor, the president of the board sit as ex officio members. Uh, the mayor, the president of the Board of Aldermen, the city councilor, and the director. I, 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 just let me so, so repeat again. it again. Uh, sorry, repeat just it. Just answer yes or no. I, Does I, the mayor or the president of the Board of Aldermen sit as ex officio members? Yes, they both do. Okay, and they're non-voting. Correct. Okay, but we didn't put the comptroller on. This is a, bo a board of v &A, and I was just wondering why not. Um, honestly... When we worked on this, I was told, you know, who should be the ex officio members. I was just the drafter. Who I didn't get into the that? policy. Um, I think Debbie could speak to that. So because no, 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 Debbie cannot. You just said to me you were told. I told I worked specifically with Debbie Allen on drafting this bill. So Debbie told you that 
Debbie told me to put how on the, the composition would work based on how other CGCs were organized. Okay, so Debbie told you who to put on the, the as the non uh, yes. voting ex officios. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then the director of public safety and the city councilor, we moved him down here. He is still an ex officio non voting member. Correct. Okay. So, not speaking to the alderman from the 24th, my concerns became. This is very heavily weighted toward judges. Mm -hmm. Elected officials who I think are wonderful people and the people actually directly vote for them and there are only two places, a uh, few places in the state of Missouri that don't uh, elect their own judges, us being one of them. Um, and in fact, in our constitution, Missouri constitution, there are only two places that are prohibited from changing how they either elect judges or appoint judges. That would be St. Louis and Kansas City, which I think is illegal and unconstitutional. Um, but saying all of that, I find offense that the elected of other elected officials are, uh, are um, not thought of so highly and that everything is about judges, no disrespect, and about who the mayor appoints. And if I, I always understand, I, I don't understand when we put the mayor and the comptroller or the mayor and the president of the Board of Aldermen, because we do have a board of ENA, so I don't understand leaving one member out. That doesn't make sense to me. And I've been around here longer than everybody except for one alder person. So that doesn't make sense to me politically. Because when you go before and you need things from the comptroller, I, don't, I, think I, I, I can't speak. You. I can't speak to the policy about this. You don't this, have so. to. I'm talking okay. to you. You don't have to okay. speak to it. You just can be quiet and let me talk, okay? And then when I have a question, I'll ask you. Okay, How's yes, that? Thank you very much. I don't understand that. So I think that's a mistake. Um, I so I actually got out the state statute, um, which you referenced on page one, section seventy point two ten through seventy three twenty five and have it here. And so I was trying to understand, because uh, this is really about municipalities, where in here exactly allows this to happen? Cause so can you d direct me to the exact state um, statutes in there that allows this to happen, this particular? If I could step away for a second and I can grab the section, then I could tell you. Thank you. with all the things that's been going on with other parts of our parking and the, uh, and, uh, the treasurer, I do not want to set up something that then 20 and 30 or 40 years later somebody says is illegal um, because we operated with a parking commission for many, many years. We had a man and it was great. Then we got a black female and it was declared illegal. So I want to make sure that we're doing this legally. I had a lot of emails yesterday, so I'm flipping through I because understand. I specifically cited I it to an email, and that's what I thought would be the easiest way for me to find it. But unfortunately, I had probably about 75, so just let me. I understand. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Would, would you like a five minute break while you kind of go through your notes or two um, minutes? Let me. It might, it might help to do something like that. I don't want to, if everybody needs to take a break, you know. No, this will be a good time because okay. we've been here for a while. That will give me a minute to, Why to locate it. Why don't we take a five-minute break, okay. and then you can go over your notes, and then we'll reconvene. Okay. We're uh, reconvening the meeting of the Intergovernmental Affairs. We had a five-minute break. Thank you for your patience. Um, I want to give you a backdrop also to how this ordinance was structured and why we structured it this way. Uh, obviously when you're dealing with other entities that are not city offices, you know, you don't have a pa the power through an ordinance to, to have them form an agreement or a council together. So 
one of the ways we conceptually came up with this is, well, we knew that we needed an intergovernmental agreement. Mm -hmm. So we looked back at the ordinance that we have used in the past, or one of the ways we did this in the past, which was how we formed Regis. And Regis was formed in this same fashion, and we actually kind of modeled the ordinance off of the Regis ordinance. So if you take a look at 70, section 7260, uh, what this is, and kind of rewinding a little bit back to, to explain what this ordinance is doing, is this is actually just the enabling legislation that allows the parties to enter into, or the city to enter into an intergovernmental agreement with these parties that will form this specific council. And if you take a look at 7260, this allows for the parties to enter into a joint contract that then may in turn provide for the establishment of a joint board. And that's what's happening here, is that these entities are coming together with other governmental offices, with the state and, and you know, kind of what are county offices, to form this joint board so that they can actually function together and you know, make recommendations and get grant money if they want grant money. To. So that's, that's why we formed it in this fashion. Okay, I hear what you're saying, but the whole point, what I'm asking, my question, it goes to what is uh, State Statute 70 in the first place? And oh. what I see it speaking to and what it's in reference to is municipalities. If I could see if this was St. Louis City and Pine Line putting this joint thing together, I understand. I don't get, and I don't see here, where it allows for St. Louis City to uh, 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 create this structure, it's like a corporation, not a limited partnership, but a corporation, and then call that uh, uh, a joint municipality. It's not a municipality, it's not a governing body, it's not a political subdivision. So my question becomes, again, how do we, under this state statute, create this? So, so you think that this is just limited to specifically um, other municipalities, it actually even allows other governmental entities. And I'm going to locate that specific section. That's what I was asking. Okay. So sorry if I. No problem. Okay. I'm going to. This is a lot. Let me say this. Um, it, so, 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 so sometimes when I am cross examining, I have to watch myself because I go, Psst, lawyer, and I just want to. <laughs> and what I'm really trying, I, I, I like the idea. But I really am concerned about that we are doing it the correct way. I don't want this to come up that we're not doing the correct way. And I, I want to admire your effort and things like that. But I really, with things like this, like citations where I can go right to it. Mm -hmm. You gave me a, a, a citation, but I couldn't find it within here. Um, so that's what I'm wanting to know exactly where, where it, it is. Yeah, we, we have used this before in... Um in other agreements that we've entered into with the state, so I know that I it, understand. That okay. doesn't make it legal. I know. I know. Let me find it. Um, <laughs> that means we just did it before. So yes, hold on. It's actually seventy two twenty. Political subdivisions may cooperate with each other with other states, the United States, or private persons, and so it allows the parties under this statute to enter into these cooperative agreements. Political subdivision of the state. Let me bring you up. Here, why don't I give you this because I can pull it up. That's right. <laughs> I'm pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just. I gave him this, but okay. I'm used gotcha. to this, so I can yeah, go back yeah. and get it. Pretty good. So. With an elective or appointed, appointed official, or with a duly authorized agency of the United States, or of this state, or with states, or with any private person, firm, association, or for the planning, development, public improvement, or facilities of common service. So 
I can see where you would get that. I'm going, you know, I still have some questions about it. I'm going to be asking for a legal opinion, a written legal opinion about this. And I, I do have some questions about it. I'm going to move on from that. Okay. okay. I can see where you get that though. Okay. Okay. Um, you can just keep it because I got it here. Got <laughs> yes. I printed it out. Um, then my next question was, I also had a lot of concerns about the powers and duties. I, in fact, I put a no by it when I was reading it. Um, what, what page? Um, page four and five. Um, talking about the powers and duties, I, I questioned about being able to sell land and things like that. Um, the alderman from the 22nd talked about it was like SLDC. For me, that is an automatic no when he said that. I think SLDC is horrible. And I think that other aldermen would tell you that too. So when I conjured that up as something that would operate, uh, that doesn't give me a good feeling of something that I have a confidence in, okay? I'm very critical of them. I think that they ha they don't operate within good city uh, government. So the manager, I'm wait, 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 please don't. I won't interrupt you. So. I'm just saying, let me ask again, um, so, so we're, we're, we're forming this corporation that, and they will be able to sue and be sued in the corporation's name, that's correct? Correct. Okay. And then um, you say they need to be able to take and hold any property real or personal in fee simple. So when you say take, you don't mean it as in a take. No, right? not an eminent domain. You just mean hold and no. buy and purchase, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and when you say this, are you envisioning like if they needed a headquarters or something like that? At the time that this was drafted, um, you know, there are certain powers that are laid out by the state when you form an entity like this. So some of those powers were just restated as a matter of course. Um, but one thought was if they had office, any office um, that they would need to lease, any office space, uh, the other thought was that potentially if, I mean, notice that it doesn't just say, um, you know, real property, it says personal property. So I, I, I don't know. Furniture. Yeah, exactly. Right. I don't know what else could potentially be there, but we just wanted to make sure we had our bases covered when I, so that's, I wrote it as in a way that would provide flexibility. It wasn't with any specific vision in mind at this point. It was more like, okay, well, here are the powers that go along with this. Let's make sure that we have some flexibility in order to allow that flexibility. I mean, you can always, you know, that, that's how I was drafting it with the drafter's intent from a legal perspective. Okay, but could we envision limiting that to purchasing uh, property for uh, office space? Because we, um, and I'll give you an example why I, I've been here too long. Mm -hmm. We voted, when I voted, when, and I still voted against it, we gave that, uh, property over there to the, the, the world-class blues, and they were supposed to be paying to uh, fix it up when, when, when we voted for that lease. Okay. And then, behind our backs, SLDC branches changed the contract. Now, I think that's illegal. We just never done anything about it. And then went from changing the contract to we spending millions and millions of dollars. So, fool me once, shame on you me twice. I also was here for the Rams lease. I'm one of two people here that was here for the original Rams lease and railed against the provision that the Rams used to leave as an attorney, how that that was not a good provision. So I now am careful about city government giving entities such as this too much power because mm -hmm. then they tend to operate with all of that power and say, well, you gave it to us. I will say from a legal perspective, there's no harm in changing what you just said. I mean, certainly the intent of this legislation is not to be some secret way to grab, you know, property. I mean, I that was, that. yeah, yeah. So this was not what the intent of it was. And there's been other places in this legislation in this committee sub where you can see that I have made right. some amendments to address concerns right. that people may have had that thought might be happening, which were not. So uh, this was not what the purpose of it was at all. It was to be similar to what Regis has. And, and again, I'm telling yeah. you, I didn't think that. Yeah. 
when, when I, we I did the Rams deal, people said, when I brought that up, they said, oh, the Rams would never do that, yeah. uh, except until they did, okay? okay. So uh, in law school, we uh, have learned that we try to cover those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's a concern. I think I heard some support from the Alderman from the 24th, that's a concern. And if that's the kind of thing we can kind of bring in so that we don't give them so much latitude, yes, if you have the money and you want to buy your own office, okay, but we don't want you to be out purchasing property. Next thing you know, you're asking for eminent domain. Yeah, if you like want to, certainly that power can be curtailed. I okay. mean, that is not something that, you know, that is not an issue in, in the mind of when I was told to draft this legislation. <laughs> so, no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, so they would be allowed to apply for grants if they don't compete with other members. So exactly. if they were applying for a grant and the circuit attorney was also applying for, or the sheriff's office or whatever the city, then they would be prohibited from applying for that same grant? They would be it? prohibited. Probably the ideal situation would be for them to be partners in the grant. Okay. Mm -hmm. But if they didn't want, if the other entity didn't want to share, they would be they, We would not allow competition. That would, that would defeat the whole purpose of the CJCC. Okay. And I heard you talk about uh, the city defenders, or uh, what's the name of the Arch city. Arch city defenders was also one of your subcommittees or one of the people you were working with? Uh, Is that what I heard? I have to have Debbie speak to that. I, okay, I, she's shaking her head. I'll take that as a yes. Um, and then on page six of eight, It talks about uh, D, bylaws, quorums, and officers. Um, it brings into uh, Missouri State Statute 610 and State Statute 104-452 um, as amended. And can you kind of go over that with me? I didn't pull that, so that was a um, lot to let me Let me pull it up so while I'm talking you. to you so I, I make sure. I wrote this back, I think, December. So, I yeah, I want to meet. And again, I'm sorry. I, I just get like that. I still want to be a public defender. Okay. I, I should have probably <laughs> thought of, next time I remember, if I have citations, I'll have them ready. Um, 610, I believe, is a sunshine law. Okay. Um, and so that's the reason why we referenced that. Um, just let me make sure I'm not. Oh, yeah, this has to do with the Sunshine Law. So the first one has to do with the Sunshine Law. Okay. And then the 105.452 has to do with conflicts of interest, but I'm going to just cite to it specifically. It's more about ethical boundaries, so let me make oh, sure. Oh, yes, we, you could write a whole chapter on that for the whole city of St. Louis. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's enough right there. I just <laughs> hadn't pulled that. Okay. okay. Um, and then we won't know who the chair of the CJCC will be until they actually form it and elect a chair, or is the chair appointed? How does that work? So we'll obviously have to get an intergovernmental agreement in place first. So everybody's right. going to have to sign that. And then at that point, there'll be the, the process that happens as far as who's the chair when they have their first okay. actual meeting. And we actually still have to draft the bylaws, too. So we decided to hold off doing, obviously, drafting the bylaws okay. until, yeah, exactly, we know for sure what's going to happen. And so um, I saw that the, uh, the people who are employed, the staff and things, will be um, under the city's classified service plan. And this is a question for the alderman. Have we checked with the uh, personnel director to be on board with that? I can't um, say for sure if, the, if they check with the... Um, can you find out? So, I can find out, but... Oh, I can call and find out. I mean, I'm just saying... Because I don't know if we can just say that they're under the certified plan like that or there's something else that, when I was the chair of the public employees, I found out a lot of things that we thought we could do. The personnel director has a lot of power, so I just wanted to. It, it reminds me of when we uh, formed the um, Civilian Review Board, mm -hmm. and I do believe that the director of Civilian Review is a civil service. Uh, I understand what you're saying. And so however that process worked for that position to be civil service, I imagine it would be the exact same process. Okay. Um, if you, but if you don't, I will. I still will check with the, uh, I, the director of personnel. I just want to make sure we're going through the correct process, okay, whatever that is. Um, I believe that we did look at that ordinance 
and modeled it off of that same language that you're talking about, the Civilian Oversight Board. But I understand we'll check with him. And again, okay. I tell you, so when something has been in place for 30 years and then um, it's declared not legal, so I don't, okay, and many things myself since I've been here that people told me this is the way it was done, it's not the way it's done and it's not legal. When I start pulling things, like the mayor just appointed some people to the Forest Park Advisory Board, but I was here when we created that and she didn't do them legally. So she has members on the Forest Park Advisory Board that are not legal because you have to go through a certain step that she didn't go through. So I just want ours to be correct, okay? Thank you. Um, Oh, um, chapter, uh, section seven, page seven of eight. It says the intergovernmental corporation agreement shall provide that the CJCC shall terminate or dissolve at five years from the effective date of this ordinance unless two thirds of its voting membership determines that it should remain in effect. It goes on to say that the intergovernmental co cooperation agreement shall also provide for at least one other method of termination and for any members of the agreement to withdraw its participation under the agreement. So I kind of, kind of trying to figure out what that would be. So that's kind of vague. Um, and do we have any idea what that would be? Uh, so there, there could be a situation in which, you know, one of the members of the CJCC decides that they no longer want to be part of the CJCC. So we want to make sure that we have an out for them and that the, the intergovernmental agreement will address that in the language in the agreement, obviously, the agreement has to be signed by all the members. Okay. So it's not like something, you know, it, it's not like they're gonna be bound by something that they don't agree to, obviously, because they're gonna, you know, participate in the drafting of this. You know, we'll send the language off to their attorneys and they'll change it as needed, okay? And the first part of seven is really kind of a sunset clause. I always think that the Board of Aldermen should put sunset clause where it should have to come back to the Board of Aldermen, because we need to see if this thing is really working or not. I don't mind trying new things, but if it's not working, I don't necessarily want to leave it up to everybody else and not the members of the board, but I, that's just something I wanted to say to you. It doesn't have to be. Well, Madam um, Chairman, that was the intent of me asking to have that put in there, because this is new and because there may be some trust issues and because, you know, people may want to check. People need to be able to opt in and opt out. In but I'm mind. saying, why wouldn't we? So, so Sunset Clause can also say has to come back every five years to the Board of Aldermen, and then we can approve it. Oh yeah, and and so one of the things I was wanting is an annual report so right. that we that. know how it's working the mayor every and the board. year. And right. so after about five years, we should know whether we should stick with this or just say, you know what, it's not working. But what I'm saying is right now, we don't have a way to say it's not working. Right. They can do it. And so I would love to see a sunset clause. We used to put them in all the time where the board has to come back before the board to approve it every five years or seven years or whatever. That's just a suggestion that you don't have to take all the um, And the report that it c comes to the mayor and the Board of Aldermen is due on the 30th of September. Is that correct of each f fiscal year? Uh, what page are you on? I think uh, page 8 of 8. Okay. Uh, second yes. 10. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's September 30th. And then we're both going to, we're going to have two severability clauses. We're going to have one in the agreement and then one in the board bill itself. Is that correct? <laughs> I'm pretty good. <laughs> okay. Um, um, I have. I don't have any further questions, but I know that. Uh, do you have any further questions, Alderman, from the 9th? I do not. The Alderman from the 24th had a good question, and I didn't take it. I, let, I saved it for him. <laughs> so uh, thank you again, uh, Madam Chairperson. Uh, so I, the, the, the attorney in me will always look at uh, these things and pick them apart. And I think really what I was uh, trying to get at earlier when I uh, talked about the, the composition of the board itself, 
I think I kind of uh, honed in on on uh, the the thing in my head there uh, is that uh, there's not a definition for supportive services, and so I think without without a definition there, I think that there could be a lot of I mean, that that could be basically anything in the in the criminal justice system. We talked about that, but we talked about it being within the agreement. Okay, the that, criteria. But we could put within here, mm -hmm. you know, to ensure that within the agreement that there's a certain criteria that's agreed upon by the members. Because I, I think if we define supportive services, I, I, I guess I should say, I think the way that the sponsors of this bill define supportive services could really sway the, 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 the effect of the whole thing over time. Uh, my my fear would be that without a w what I, what I would uh, consider a, a a good definition of supportive services that this could turn into almost another hammer for the state in in the criminal justice world uh, rather than a vehicle for uh, meaningful reform, which I know is the intent of the bill. Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that's an excellent idea, and that's exactly why we wanted that in here, and that's just a, an oversight. We certainly talked about that because we just want to make sure that we're memorializing the spirit and the intent and that we execute upon that. And um, so when we contemplated that, we said, you know, that really needs to come, those, those recommendations for those two individuals need to come from the executive director, who is really, frankly, the most... Um, neutral of all these parties and cl closest to the work and that they themselves need to have a set of criteria just as a check and balance exactly because in that way everybody it's transparent everybody understands that common vision for those two things so um, I, I couldn't agree more and that has been the conversation it just does need to be put in here that was just an oversight of not but that is the purpose if, of both having it within the ordinance and further, even more further defined in the agreement itself. That is the hope. Perfect, yeah. And, uh, my, my only concern would be without that, that the, the, get... the term supportive services kind of oh, goes yes. across the board. You could have a guy from <laughs> Glock <laughs> come in and say, hey, you it know, things, we provide right? support to law <laughs> <Right>. enforcement <laughs> officials. Exactly. You know? I was going to say people quickly forget things. Absolutely. And things change real quick, so we really need to memorialize it. So thank you for that. Thank you. And nothing further. He's not the sheriff. I want to hear the sheriff. The sheriff. All right. Um, Alderman, um, the other thing is I just wrote down. So you're going to allow for how people can withdraw. I just want to make sure there's not going to be any penalty. If people find this is not working for them, that there won't be any penalty um, about withdrawing. If they find out this is not something. There's no penalty clause in the bill but whatsoever. I, but I don't want it to be in the... Uh, agreement either. They said they're going to write up how you can withdraw, but I'm hoping that there would not be something that penalizes people if they find like this, find out this is not working for them, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I'm saying that you just don't want to have retribution right. in, in, in if sort I'm of those untangible ways. Say, this is not working. Absolutely. I really like it, but then the next thing I know, you can't stop the other, the like that, but you can make sure that there's nothing that, you know, penalizes or say you still have to do this or you have to pay this amount or something like that. I, We're not looking for that. We're looking for cooperation because people want to cooperate. Right. right. I, I guess my thinking on this is, and I, I welcome your feedback on it, it would be nice if we can get some language in there that even if formally they're, like let's say they formally take their name off, that we should still invite them to the table. I think that's so important because maybe just at that moment they can't, but maybe in the future, and we just never want to, it would just be, we need everybody. And so I think that's what I'm thinking in the language is you still can participate. Right. Yeah. Would you agree with that? I do. Yeah. I, I do. I, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank the sponsor. We've been, maybe, you may think that we've been hard, but I think we all, three of us, agree with this, 
and we want to see the best it can be Absolutely. and we don't want to make a mistake and um, when I first got here Tom Villa was the president of the board he used to talk about working committees that you didn't just pass things out that you actually took things apart okay. and then when people voted for it they bought in right. and I think that's what we were trying to do. Absolutely the best product comes out of this right here. Right so, so um, that's why uh, I would like the rest of the yeah, I, I'm not the chair and I don't want to vote up but I do have we have some suggestions we would like to make to you I would like to see the sheriff here I appreciate the sheriff coming I would like to invite Kim to come over and I would love to hear the Arch City Defenders or some of your other support people that are not part of the mainstream traditional come and talk and speak to this too and, I, and madam chair I want to point out that that's why going back to people I said earlier opt in opt out we changed on page to okay. line nine, we change shall to may. I saw that. So that is for any reason right now, let's say the sheriff just absolutely says diametrically opposed to this, I'm not participating. It's okay. But I wanted to leave the door open. I didn't want to just this entity to be created because right now there's a personality conflict Correct. and then, you know, it is what it is and they can't get involved. Right. You know, so that's why we wanted to I want it to be as fluid as possible, right. you know, so that um, no matter who's um, the public defender, the police commissioner, the mayor, or whatever, that this still can work. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think so, you all have done a good job. Thank you. And if you would, time is of the essence to get this out. Uh, I would ask if we can have another hearing, you know, Monday or Tuesday on this and, and look at your recommendations and see what we can put in here to make it better. Okay. You, I'm not the chair. I will right. check with the and chair. And I'll ask Alderman Moore. Oh, I will talk but. to him. He I'm, I'm supposed to call him right after this. I will check with him, but I will be glad to have. Um, I'm already having a meeting Tuesday anyway, you know, so if that's what I need to do with the rules anyway, because we're meeting Wednesday. Right. Right. So and if he doesn't mind me having a Monday meeting, I will do that, but I won't overstep my boundaries, okay? Right. And also, um, you know, we're not in control of anybody else's schedule but our own. But and I, so if for any reason the sheriff cannot attend or the circuit then cannot he can attend, do it can, point can, cannot, okay. okay. All right. but, but I really wanted to give him a chance first and the circuit attorney. And I'll call them personally myself. Sure. And then if they can't, then they'll send somebody. But I wanted them to have a chance. And I know the arch Certainly we did too. Right. Okay. Uh, that's why everybody was notified. Oh, okay. okay. Everybody was notified. I personally... You know, I had a conversation with the circuit attorney about it, All and right. it's through working with her that we came up with some some better ideas of how to make it better, and and that's how we got to the point where we are right well, and now. And I'm going to personally advise her to send a, a, a designee if she cannot come. Okay. I think that's um, a great idea. Right. So, and um, I know that there's someone here from the sheriff, but. Just so I don't politically get in trouble, I want to make double, triple, make sure that <laughs> the sheriff has his own personal in invitation, okay? And then if that... Alder woman. Women, do you know, not, not know that women are the majority of the elected officials citywide in this city now? Absolutely. And we are equal in the number of women on the board of aldermen, 14 and 14? Absolutely. All right. That's great. <laughs> Just so you can see. Okay. Sheriff Betts is on my... 2.51 p.m. call. <laughs> I cleared this with him. Okay. He said, please go on my behalf. Okay. But I he didn't understand. know, did he know we were going to meet again? No, he had a prior engagement, that he, or a prior commitment that he had to get to. No, not, did so, he know we were going to meet again, not today? He does not know that you're okay, going to meet so again. If, so if he I can't will make come, sure. Then you can come, but I want him to have a chance to make his own presentation. I right? will make sure that he is well aware of whenever your next meeting is. However, and I'm sorry, are, what is your name, sir? Sergeant Timothy Hale. Thank you, Sergeant. And we are the three people that work with the community, uh, the uh, CJCCC committee on all this on behalf of the sheriff. Great. So you guys are doing a good job. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, I will get to work as soon as we finish. We've had a long meeting, um, but it was a great presentation. And so if you, have, if you don't have anything else, we're going to adjourn and come back either Monday or Tuesday. Okay. I'd like to thank the small committee that did good <laughs> work today for their due diligence. And it's certainly our um, hope to just make the best bill possible. All right. It will never be perfect, but you know, certainly best bill possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just not even do a motion. The, <laughs> the Intergovernmental Affairs Committee is adjourned. <laughs>